a flowering. Wallflowers are coming out. You understand what I'm trying to say? People are becoming involved. There is interaction here. I talked to a preacher one time and said, Man, Brad, when I left that church, it fell apart. I said, What did you put it together with? <laughs> And the Apostle Paul, somebody said, what you reading lately? I'm reading Gordon Fee on 1 Corinthians. On these commentaries, powerful commentary, reading him. 1 Corinthians, reading him. Going over it. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, the different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of working, but the same God works in all of them. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one that is given through the Spirit, message of wisdom, you know, all of those things. You've got to read them there because the time is gone. And, but verse 11 says, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. Now listen to this. Hear this. we got a little saying now. Listen up, people. Listen up, people. He gives them to each one just as he determines. Are you listening to me out there? Listen up, people. He gives it as he determines. I saw my son's pastor here today. Gave him a great big bear heart. He baptized my boy. Straight away, he brought him back, baptized him. You know I love him. Boy's working in the church now. I said, how's everything coming? Fine. And I said to some other the brethren next to me who were talking with me, I said, you know, if I had the power I would give my two sons the gift of ministry. You know, every man wants the boys to follow in his tree. But I found out that it is not mine to give. If it were in the Middle Ages church, I could provide a sinusure for my sons and give them a bishopric somewhere. If I were a rich man, I could buy it. Are you listening to me? But in the church of the living God, where the Holy Spirit is the chief administrator, papas cannot give sons gifts. It is only the Holy Spirit that pours out these gifts, and the Holy Spirit gives them to whoever he will. And you know what the church's business is? Keep on looking and determine where the gifts are. Every one of you ought to be a talent scout. You ought to be looking for people down in the minor leagues. You understand what I mean? And then bring them on up little by little. You see, don't throw them in that big league right away. Protect them from those old wolves. <laughs> then bring them along little by little through the preliminaries. And I guarantee you again, they'll grow. They'll develop. And they'll tell you, somebody believed in me. Gifts are given to the whole church. Gifts are given to be used. We are not to create a hierarchy of gifts where one is higher than the other. The Apostle Paul says, some you think are not so hot are what you need. <laughs> some that look pretty are not as helpful as those that look ugly. Sorry for that plain talking here in this group. All are needed. All are essential. You know, a Negro College Fund says, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, but in the church of the living God, we must say that a gift is a terrible thing to waste. Ephesians 4 and verse 16, after the marvelous passage where he talks about the gift, and I want to give you a little theology right now. The, in, in Ephesians 4, the gifts are persons. Did you hear me? But in 1 Corinthians 12 and, and in Romans 12 and in 1 Peter 4, I think it is, the gifts are charisms, charisma. The difference there. It may not be so far afield. One very handsome preacher stood before the mirror one morning and said, I am God's gift. That's what the, we say, it's a apocryphal preacher's story. But it may not be so far afield for you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. You are God's gift to this church. But your business is to call the charisms into action. 
And then finally Paul says in, for, in Ephesians 4, verse 16, From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Each part does its work. When I went down to Louisiana, Brother Miller, Cyril, preaching as a young intern, I used to visit around the churches trying to get to know people, you know, and get into it. I'd been in a sheltered Adventist culture for 20 years. I had to meet people. I had to learn to meet people, so I went to the church, and I listened. Nobody knew I was as such a kid anyway. They didn't think I was a preacher, and I heard them sing, and I heard them pray, and I heard them preach. And they sang one of Wesley's hymns that goes like this, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a mortal dying soul to save and fitted for the sky to serve this present age my calling to fulfill oh may it all my powers engage to do my master's will when the battle waxes hot we press everyone into service no wonder the prophet Joel saw Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. And the today's English version says that and sons and daughters will proclaim my message. As preaching, what does it say? Proclaim my message. We've got to go beyond where we are now. We've got to move, we've got to shake off the old debt, the old vestiges of Romanism that's still among us. <laughs> We are radical reformers. We are not like our evangelical brethren. If we were carbon copies of them, clones, if we were clones of evangelicalism, then one of us would be unnecessary. We are Sui or Swiss generis. We're the only one of a kind we are here to raise up the foundations of many generations. Long lost truths are be, to be recovered and we cannot be too bound up with others as to fetter ourselves in the discovery of truth and in the proclamation thereof. We must love them all, fellowship with them all, but by and by we will come to the parting of the ways and you will have to say, I have a charge to keep. I have a God to glorify. I have a message to preach and I am a radical reformer. We do not stand where Luther stood. Luther brought us as far as he could, but Luther had a lot of problems. Luther had to depend on the prince. I hope I don't hurt anybody's feeling. There came a time when Luther said, the peasants have got to go by any means told the prince stab them, rip them, pillage them. I can't understand it all. I'm not, I'm not uh, criticizing Luther. I couldn't put a patch on his path. So far beyond me. But I want to tell the truth. I want to witness here tonight to the people of God in the, in the last decade of the 20th century at the beginning on the eve of the third millennium when grace is soon to give way to glory huh? these rapid movements are already picking up pace and so I'm going to say here today tonight don't be arguing about women in ministry just let the Holy Ghost do his work you step back and say, ride on, King Jesus, <laughs> to victory ride on. Why you say out there? If the Lord calls Samuel, let Eli listen up. The question is not, do women have a right to be ordained? Nobody has a right to be ordained. But the church has an obligation to recognize the gifts and to affirm those gifts and those gift bearers 
so that the church can roll on. Shake the cobwebs out of your head. Shake the dust from off your garments. Church of the living God, rise and shine for your light is come. Ordained preachers, do not make your ordination an initiation into a theological club of the good old boys. He that would be greatest among you, let him be a servant. We are to facilitate the gifts in others, to draw them out the best in them. Keep reading the Bible, it'll help you. It'll help you to discover that there are some things in the Word of God that are explicit and others implicit. Jesus upbraided the Pharisees and said, You do err not knowing the Scriptures or the power of God. They were talking about resurrection, folks. There was no explicit doctrine of the resurrection, but it was implicit. And it's a how in the world can we know Sadducees don't believe in resurrection, you know. And Jesus said, well, didn't you know that Moses said? Implicit. Are you listening to me? Implicit. He said, God is the God of the living, not the dead. Therefore, you ought to know that there is a resurrection. You don't need to have a text in the Bible that said, thou shalt ordain women. You don't need that. I like to love to tell in my evangelistic meetings where Moody used to say when they came in, Mr. Moody, give us a text. Can you give us a text? Thou shalt not smoke. Moody said, no, I can't give you one that said, thou shalt not smoke, but I give you one that said, keep on smoking. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Implicit. Not always explicit. How readest thou? What do you know about God? What is the character of God? God research is a big God. You cannot put him into your little theological book. You cannot put him in a box. You cannot limit him. He told Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, I am going to send my spirit and he blows wherever he wants to blow. Are you listening to me? And if he want to blow on she, it's the same as when he blows on he. Because all flesh is mine. So I got to